Astute Journalism and the Brunswick Beacon present The Basement Files. Hi, I'm Linda NTR. And I'm Mark Logie. Welcome to this edition of Basement Files. Our top stories are Technology Obsession, Bodybuilding for Women, Living Vegan. Last July, St. Thomas University announced Mr. Bernie Lucht, one of TVC's renowned producers, as the Irving Chair in Journalism. Since his arrival in January, Mr. Lucht has been visiting classes and meeting with students on campus. Frank Molly has more on the story. Bernie Lucht, producer, journalist, and currently Stu's Irving Chair in Journalism, shared his knowledge and experience to a small crowd last week at Holy Cross Conference. The on-campus lecture series, The Art of Documentary, are focused on the rudimentary and fighting concerns of writing, editing, and producing audio documentaries. He says that journalism today is a big job. Therefore, journalists need to focus on their ability to produce large amounts of information very quickly. The usefulness of these lectures helps to expose participants to long-form journalism. In my work, it's longer form. So we, we work on stories over a longer period of time. It's a slightly different thought process, and the result is different. And I think it's closer to magazine journalism than it is to news journalism. So to the extent that it's useful for people, and I think on some of this I'm only scratching the surface, to, uh, to uh, have exposure to ideas about how in, in audio documentary we practice long form, I think it's great to do and I enjoy doing it. About nine people arrived to hear the fifth lecture entitled, Putting It All Together. Looked described the importance of protecting and gathering good material, ultimately mastering to recognize what is important in the material. He played a number of audio episodes from a program he helped create as executive producer of the CBC radio series Ideas, and related how each had touch points, visual imagery, and action th through the use of narrative. Kirsten Slote, a first-year international student, said she enjoyed the lecture and has plans on entering the journalism program. My name is Kerstin Schlote and I'm in my first year and I plan to do a major in journalism so I try to find my way to either print or radio or TV and I find it really interesting that this workshop was offered because it explored like how you do documentaries. And Although Bernie's period here as Irving's chair in journalism is coming to a close he hopes to return soon to continue working and meeting with students. You know, normally I've come here for a couple of days in connection with another project we do, which is the Dalton Camp Project. I have loved being here. I've loved meeting the students, meeting the classes, working with the teachers. It's been fabulous. Everybody has been so kind. For Stu Journalism, I'm Frank Molly. On Sunday, a U.S. Army sergeant killed at least 16 Afghan civilians in a shooting spree. The victims were mostly women and children from two villages in the Panjwai district. The event has raised questions about America's involvement there. After the death of Osama bin Laden and 10 years of conflict, the United States is still involved and fighting in Afghanistan. The event has also deepened animosities towards Americans, following the burning of Korans and the urinating on of Afghan soldiers carried out by the U.S. in the past. Both Afghan and U.S. officials have condemned the attack and the United States says it is investigating. Keep watching The Basement Files for these stories in the coming weeks. I'm Samantha Both. Have you ever wondered what being a pothead is really like? Step into the stoner world. I've been around politics for a long time. know a lot of people in politics who happily use marijuana, uh, even at fairly high levels. Living as a stoner in the weeks ahead, on The Basement Files. I'm Alicia Bosch. Genetically modified crops have been around for years. Now, fish may be the next genetically modified organism on the table. Well, this method of actually genetically modifying fish speeds up the whole process. Scientists say genetic modification is no different than selective breeding, but it still has a long way to go before it is completely accepted. Genetically modified food, in the weeks ahead, on The Basement Files. I'm Tyler Lyons. One of the numerous now closed mills in the Miramichi is preparing to reopen for business. This is great news for the city's economy. 
there was about 120 or 130 positions that were lost when the mill closed the last time. So to be able to uh, get those folks back here, if there's an interest there, um, would be a great boost to us. But is this a long-term solution to Miramichi's low amount of work? Or is there something new that the city needs? The Miramichi State of Employment in the weeks to come on The Basement Files. A new study shows that young people who go without their gadgets and technology can have similar withdrawal symptoms to drug addicts. Vanessa Cormier takes a look at society's obsession with social media and technology. 70% of the world's population has mobile phones. As of the year 2011, Apple has sold almost 60 million iPhones worldwide, while Google's Android is growing at 886% a year and now activating over 160,000 devices a day. One thing I probably couldn't live without would probably be my cell phone. Because if anything happened and I was, in, I was stuck without one, I think it would be tough to work through an emergency situation or something like that. So what about the 30% who don't have a mobile phone? For Julie Pickard, a second year student at St. Thomas University, not having a cell phone meant not getting the job. I just had to refuse a job because of that be very reason, yeah. Because they expect you to have that on your person all the time, so it's very, so in a, especially in today's world where everyone thinks you're so technologically advanced, even such a young person, um, it, it is very difficult not to have one, but I just choose not to have one because I'm a student and I don't want that bill every month. <laughs> These smartphone technologies allow users to download thousands of apps, which range from games, news, books, and more, all conveniently located through a quick swipe of a fingertip. This recent popularity spike in smartphones has made it easier for users to connect to social media websites like Facebook and Twitter. Sean O'Neill finds his BlackBerry useful when accessing his Twitter account. The fourth year student admits he has tweeted over 100 times in one day. I don't know if I could go days without checking Twitter because again, it's, it's my news source, it's how I stay connected to the world. The avid Twitter user says the website is giving him a leg up on the competition in the field of journalism. It's absolutely essential for a guy who's trying to make it into the business like me and the reason why is if you, because of hashtags, because of one follower retweeting it if, if they like it, it, get, it gets the word out. And I think in today's day and age, you kind of also have to make, yeah, you're a reporter, but you also kind of have to brand yourself and you have to market yourself. O'Neill's Blackberry has given him a gateway to access social media at all times. He is not the only one hooked on Twitter. At 200 million users, Twitter has gained a lot of popularity over the past few years. However, this is only a fraction of Facebook's popularity. The website, which was created in 2004, has over 800 million users. One of its main selling points is that it builds closer ties among friends and colleagues. For many, checking Facebook dozens of times a day is normal. Even if I'm not doing anything, I'll just check it just to I'm not. I guess it's kind of one of those social those norms that once you start Facebook, you just have to always check into it. Sometimes I'll check it five times a day, <laughs> just depending on what's going on, if there's anything important. Many students check the social media sites first thing in the morning, after a big news event, or during class. A classes, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, or if my class is really boring, then I'll go on that or Twitter. Professor James Whitehead, the Director of Teaching and Learning at St. Thomas University, sees a clear connection with technology and the classroom. We get a lot of feedback from uh, teachers saying that cell phones and laptops and texting devices are a huge distraction uh, in the classroom. Um, so we can either try and fight that continuously and obviously we can try and minimize cell phones going off and this kind of stuff in class. But uh, if you actually introduce technology in the class and students can use their cell phones as clickers as well, uh, rather than actually having to buy a clicker, they can actually use their cell phones. So if you try and use them, those technologies profitably in the class, then instead of being a distraction, they actually become part of the class and they can actually 
and create a culture where the technology is not as much of a distraction. These clickers are interactive devices that let students answer multiple choice questions in class. They press the button of their choice and the response is immediately displayed on the classroom's projection screen. Although many universities currently use these clickers, only a few classes at St. Thomas are trying them out as part of the pilot project. Professor Whitehead says they have been a great addition to his science classes. I can see that there's a lot more kind of interacting between students when we're asking the clicker questions than if I just ask a, a question to the class and you get two or three same students always responding. It's nice to have everybody feel like they've got a stake in answering the question correctly and getting credit for having answered a question correctly and, and participating in the, in the discussion in the class. Whitehead says although some technologies can be a distraction, if you use the technology profitably, like the clickers, it can help in the learning experience. Not the only one at St. Thomas who is seeing the positive side of technology. Kelly Hogg, the residence manager for the university, organized social media training for the school's residence advisors. One of the things that we're seeing is that more and more students are using things like Facebook, things like Twitter in their day-to-day -day lives, and we have a number of our residence advisors who use social media. We don't require it, but they choose to use it. Um, so we thought it would be a really interesting session that they'd enjoy. During the hour-long training session, residence advisors were taught ways to maintain professionalism and connect with their house members through social media. We ourselves have a Facebook site uh, for Stu Residence Life and I know a lot of departments at St. Thomas do and we get a lot of students on there asking questions, um, looking for a verification on things, we can publicize events and it's just used more and more in day-to-day -day life. Although social media can be a useful way to connect with others, it doesn't appeal to everyone. It just, it, it just doesn't enthuse me, I guess, as, I guess more as the younger generation. I mean, I'm 35 years old, so I mean, the younger generation, they're on it all day constantly because, like, you know, they they want to feel that connection with everybody else and all. But to me, nah, I just, I guess you call me a lone wolf, I guess you would say, but I just don't have that need for that, like, you know, that constant connection with other people and all. I don't need it. I really didn't feel like it was important to keep it. Like if people need to be in contact with me, they know my phone number, they know my email address. And I feel like it's just too public now and you can't, Facebook is not what it used to be. You know, you used to send a private message to your friend to make a rendezvous and now it's like a place to promote everything you're doing everywhere you're at, every single part of the day. So are these new addictions helping or hurting us? Research conducted on university students found four in five of those students had significant mental and physical distress and panic when they had to unplug from their technology for 24 hours. Some said they felt so lost without their iPhone or Blackberry that it evoked a similar feeling to the phantom limb syndrome suffered by amputees. It's like if I don't have my phone on me, I feel like I'm missing a part of my body. Um, and it's like the connection to the rest of the world, like I get to know what's going on. It kind of ruined my life, because <laughs> now I'm super dependent on it. These findings show the growing reliance of the younger generation on technology, a constant need for people to check their cell phones. A study conducted by Lightspeed Research found that of the 1,500 adults surveyed on their social media habits, 39% were self-described Facebook addicts. 57% of women in the 18 to 34 age range say they talk to people online more than they have face-to-face -face conversations. Another 21% admit to checking their Facebook in the middle of the night. So what is the outcome of these addictions to technology? Two words, Facebook depression. The American Pediatrics Association coined the term which suggests kids may be stressed out and depressed because of the way they use social media. Facebook status updates and photos of happy looking people having great times can make people believe others are happier and that they don't measure up. Peter Weeks is a St. Thomas University professor who teaches a senior seminar on digital media. He specializes in communications. He says that maybe society isn't to blame for these addictions, but it's because of the way these technologies are designed. Well, anyway, that uh, society's obsessed 
or that people, or perhaps we could say people, are obsessed with uh, this uh, digital uh, technology. And, um, but I think we might turn it around the other way and say, now what is it about the, the system we're in here which keeps people hooked in, into it or perhaps determined or governed by it? And uh, so we have to, one aspect is that the fact that software is built into many of the gadgets we use in everyday life. With. Whether or not technology is to blame, one thing's for sure, the majority of society is hooked. Whether people are addicted or not, those who sell mobile phones are making the most of it. New cell phones keep coming out, and new customers keep coming in. Cell phones and social media have become a norm in our society, but these technologies are neither good nor bad. We can decide whether or not to be dependent on these items. For Stu Journalism, I'm Vanessa Cormier. Coming up after the break. I'm Whitney Nielsen. It takes determination and willpower to drastically change your diet. But grocery shopping might just be the hardest part. I have to go to like a, a health food store like Ori or True Food Organics. <laughs> Do Fredericton's chain supermarkets leave something to be desired? Learn about the challenges of alternative diets in the weeks ahead on The Basement Files. There always seems to be some new diet promoting a healthier lifestyle, and veganism is no exception. But as you drastically change your eating habits, there are challenges and potential consequences. Here's Whitney Nielsen with the story. A little generous portion of that. We grew up learning the five food groups to eat from grains, dairy, meat, fruit, and vegetables. But veganism takes away nearly half of these options. A vegan doesn't eat meat, fish, poultry, eggs, dairy, gelatin, or even honey. It's quite a change from the typical North American diet. But this trend is alive and well. And so is the demand for accessible vegan options in Fredericton. So what do they eat? And where do they get it? I was that person who said, what do you eat? Where do you get your protein? <laughs> and you just picture them eating salad all day. But this is a common misconception. Leah Anstis says eating a vegan diet can be easy and tasty with the right recipes. Anyone who has, who has access to, you know, a, a small, like a, like a health food store and or a bigger chain for those other items, um, I find it all depends on whether or not you can cook. That's the biggest battle. Anstis chose veganism for environmental reasons and so she won't contribute to the horrors of factory farming. Teresa Camo started her vegan diet on January 1st for the health benefits. I find there's, there's not really a lot of organic selection, at least not this time of year. Um, so I usually have to go to like a, a health food store like Ori or True Food Organics. <laughs> Many vegans like Camo push their diets further by trying to buy only local and organic foods. So while vegan shopping in Fredericton might not be that difficult anymore, shopping for vegan, organic, locally grown products may be the newest challenge. Troy Sandwith is an experienced vegan. It's been over 10 years since he's eaten any animal products. I just make sure that I'm, I'm always eating a variety of foods and not eating the same thing every day. Um, but, yeah, your sources of protein would be your beans and lentils, your nuts, and your greens. Aura Whole Foods has many vegan options. They've been in business for over 20 years. Um, we have a lot of dairy-free options. Um, cheese and yogurt. Uh, lots of meat alternatives, too. Lots of uh, local veggies and beans, stuff like that. But Aura has some new competition. Real Food Connections. Real Food Connections has been open for only a year, but business is so good they're expanding within the next three months. Levi Lawrence co-owns the business with his fiance. There's people who want to buy local uh, for nutritional value because you know they see uh, organics going into Walmarts and Sobeys and Superstore and so they're, they're questioning what organic really means uh, and whereas not everything I sell is organic uh, and a lot of it is, I can tell you the person who grew it and where they live and they'll welcome them on your farm if you want to make that extra effort and that accountability of knowing uh, that your neighbor grew it, um, it, it gives you that safety. Real Foods started as a website where people could place orders and have local food delivered to their door. 
they offer vegetable boxes for a set price, which is popular among many vegans. I actually find it cheaper to um, go to a place like Real Food Connections because you buy a veggie box and it's a set price and the variety is constantly varying and it's unreal economical. I get a box and it lasts me about three weeks before I have to reorder and a lot of people order weekly but they have a bigger family. In the summers I usually get um, like a CSA. I get my like uh, fresh weekly vegetables from a farmer. They deliver it to Fredericton. And then uh, the program isn't offered this winter, so I've been going to Real Food Connection. While it's becoming increasingly easier to shop as a vegan in Fredericton, there still are challenges. I met with Margaret Langell, a local dietitian, to speak about veganism. She says the benefits include a diet low in saturated fat, high in fiber, and rich in fruits and vegetables. But there are consequences. She says if you're looking to become a vegan, you really need to become an expert. Eliminating meat and dairy can leave you prone to deficiencies in calcium, protein, iron, vitamin D, and vitamin B12. That's why the research is so crucial. Vegans get protein and calcium from tofu, green leafy vegetables, soy milk, and almonds. They get iron from beans and lentils, B12 from fortified soy milk, and vitamin D from the sun and enriched orange juice. So then you have to learn all over, okay, if I'm not going to eat certain things, what am I going to eat in place of it? And so then it's kind of, you learn as you go. And of course at first you're always, it takes a lot of time because you don't know what you can and can't eat and you're reading labels all the time. Now the biggest obstacle for vegans is eating out. Nirvana is the only all vegan restaurant in Fredericton. They opened last year but labeled it as a vegetarian restaurant because vegan tends to scare away customers. Angela Black works at Nirvana but is not a vegan herself. I think that the excuses or the things that I've kind of pinned as reasons are because I'm from New Brunswick and I was brought up on meat and potatoes and it's, you're kind of nurtured in a certain way from different cultures. Black says vegan food like this gives her more energy and she needed less sleep on a vegan diet. Nirvana offers everything from fresh smoothies to vegan mac and cheese. We have had access to materials and the ingredients used for vegan cooking forever, but if you're talking about accessibility of vegan food on menus and restaurants, you know, that's that's very minimal because, you know, predominantly the dish that you'll find in a restaurant will be centered around the meat, right? So while vegans in Fredericton could get their groceries at chain supermarkets, they're more inclined to support local businesses. I see it saw a need especially because uh, I come from the restaurant community and I really see that eventually um, restaurants are going to take advantage of the local food movement. I've been to like places even as uh, close as PEI and as far as BC where you go into restaurants, uh, whether it's fine dining or whether it's pub food, and there's going to be farms named on the menu. Lawrence says New Brunswick is slow to pick up on the local food movement, but he hopes to change that. Before Real Food Connections, there were only really two options, or a Whole Foods or the market on Saturday. Superstore and Sobeys have natural food sections which feature organic products, but organic isn't the same thing as local. Vegetables, for example, uh, if they don't have to be transported over long distances, they can ripen on the vine in the field as opposed to ripening uh, under lights under transport, which is a huge difference. You'll end up with the same red tomato, but the sum of its parts will be completely different. While big box stores have caught up to the vegan trend, it looks like they'll have to step up their game and offer more local products if they hope to keep these new age vegans coming back. For Stu Journalism, I'm Whitney Nielsen. We have these stories in the coming weeks in the Basement Files. I'm Justin Marshall. Physical activity is important for all ages, but for kids, it's crucial. Canadian Health Measures says 60 minutes of exercise a day is required for children and youth. It helps them sleep at night, and that's good for parents. <laughs> but you know, it just uh, gets them out and gets them to meet other people. But does every child, youth, and adult get the amount of exercise they need in a day to stay healthy, active living, in the weeks to come on The Basement Files? I'm Kara Cousins. Since 1998, more than 6 million people have been killed in conflict in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Millions more have fled to get away from rebel forces. The war began and we came by foot. Recent elections have brought hope for the country. But is hope enough? 
Stories from the Congo in the weeks ahead on The Basement Files. And while we wait for stories from the Democratic Republic of Congo, here's a small glimpse of Africa. On Sunday, the UNB African Students Union hosted a two and a half hour cultural show for their Paradise Africa. Inda Intiar has the story. Yes, tonight at the Student Union building, the African Students Union is hosting its 35th annual African Night. It's showcasing different cultures and music and clothing from different parts of Africa. Let's go inside and check out what the show is like. This year's African Night was themed Peponi, or Paradise. UNB's African Students' Union and Friends put this show together to show Fredericton a glimpse of their home continent. Just a, an hour and a half or two hours and a half of Paradise, which is dancing, our culture, which is, you know, the food. I wanted, we wanted you to just experience that. Around 400 people attended and enjoyed various traditional performances and food from Africa. We spoke about Africa being a paradise and it's not all about the poverty and the famine and stuff you see and in the media. From Egyptian tahtib dance to Congolese mountain dance. From a skit about African marriage rights to traditional fashion show. From a presentation about the Egyptian revolution to rap songs about racism. The event was an eye-opener to Africa's culture and Africa's issues. For Stu Journalism, I'm Khairun Nisa Intiar. Fitness and bodybuilding competition have been around for quite some time, but the sport has recently opened up to include female figure model division. All over New Brunswick, women have been pumping iron so they can don their swimsuits and strut the stage. Bridget Yard has more on the story. Health and fitness. These words are so ingrained into our culture that they're almost cliché, but there are women in New Brunswick who are taking the words to heart. Fitness and figure competitions are growing in the province and competitors who take to the stage are often caught between promoting their healthy lifestyle and fighting the stigma that they're just bikini girls. This is Jacqueline Wilson. She's a professional figure model and she's won a national competition in order to become a bodybuilding pro. But she wasn't always such a fierce competitor. I'm definitely more muscular than I was. I always was kind of that skinny fat girl. I had the little skinny arms and, and I worked really hard to try to build up some shoulders. Wilson's been competing since 2005. She's racked up trophies, titles and even sponsorship deals. But she hasn't reached her goals yet. Wilson's ambition is to make a name for herself in the industry as a working fitness model. My goal at this point is that my brand be about a model um, who happens to be a fitness model because that is my goal. I don't want to compete forever necessarily, so I'm trying to become a model and hopefully get magazines interested to hire me. Wilson's gotten a lot of attention for her physique, but it hasn't always been encouraging. She records video blogs for one of her sponsors and posts them to YouTube. Some of the comments posted on the page are derogatory. Wilson says it comes with the territory of competing in a physique-focused sport. The media hasn't always known quite what to do with Wilson's story. Gary Bartlett, president of the New Brunswick Physique and Figure Association, submitted a story about Wilson's win at nationals to a local paper. He didn't get the response he was hoping for. They didn't run it, which really uh, irritated me too because I thought she deserved it and for them to not run it was not, in my opinion, much very fair to her. As you see hockey and everything else plastered in the sports section. Once Bartlett explained to Fredericton's Daily Gleaner that the competition was sanctioned by a legitimate federation, the story ran with the distinction bikini model. Former sports editor for the Gleaner, David Ritchie, said he and his team would talk about using provocative images and how readers would respond to them. They wanted to make sure that the event was portrayed in an appropriate way. Wilson started off competing in the figure category before her specialty, figure model, was created. The women of figure are looking to create a different body type from Wilson's. It's kind of like a scale of muscularity and leanness. So on the bottom would be bikini or figure model, which is 
kind of your fitness model look if you think of the cover of a magazine. You want to have nice shape and be toned, but you don't want to have veins and be vascular. You don't want to be that lean. Then the next step up is figure, which uh, has a little more muscularity. They're a little more lean. And where bikini has free poses, we can do whatever we want to show our personality. Figure has rigid, structured poses. Good. So try to engage Rachel LeBlanc is a veteran figure competitor who has won a national competition and gained the title professional. She coaches up-and-coming fitness competitors. She also serves as a judge on the New Brunswick circuit. Though she needs to be critical of the other women, she says competing hasn't made her self-conscious. I look at my body now more on the critical side when it comes to competing, I guess. Um, you know, to always better myself, but I don't think on a kind of self-confidence type of way that I'm hard on myself because of my competing. I kind of accept myself how I am, but I know there are better ways um, to, you know, to sculpt my body for my sport. While LeBlanc's satisfaction with her body is refreshing, the reality is that getting a stage-ready physique is no easy feat. Competitors need to be on a grueling workout schedule that often includes two trips to the gym a day. Coming up to competition, it's common for women to exercise first in the morning on an empty stomach and come back later in the day for weight training. Competitors also need to manipulate their diets to get down to a weight where their muscles will be prominent, meaning little body fat. For competition, figure model Wilson weighs 98 pounds at a height of 5 feet. According to the Body Mass Index, a measure of healthy weight, Wilson is on the lower side of healthy. I think for the long term of contest prep, it's healthy. Uh, I'm eating, you know, five, six, seven meals a day. It's all healthy, clean food, nothing processed. Um, proteins, carbs, like I don't cut, you know, carbs. There's always some sort of carb. And drinking lots of water. But then, you know, as you approach the last week, I would say it, it gets to be maybe what you would consider unhealthy. Um, you're manipulating water in your body to try to be tight and that type of thing. Wilson admits she would be unable to sustain her stage weight for a long time, but likes to stay close to that number to avoid yo-yo dieting. Registered dietitian Holly Hertz specializes in sports nutrition. She's on the fence about competitors' long-term diets because of the lack of variety. They're pretty limited, and I've seen some of the effects on people that have been on those diets for a while. We have uh, people that have lack of concentration, or they might have a wound, uh, even just a small cut that won't heal because their body's not getting the proper nutrition. Uh, this is branched chain amino acids which are the building blocks of muscles. Many fitness competitors resort to vitamins and supplements to give them an added edge. Hertz warns that these should be prescribed by a professional and that they're not for everyone. Most people think because they're getting a supplement in a health food store that they're safe, that they're effective, and that's not true. They're not tested or rigorously tested like our uh, prescription medications are and they don't have to be proven effective in order to sell them. These aren't the only health concerns that can plague competitors. In order to look defined on stage, the women need a deep golden tan. There are many spray products and lotions available, but some still choose to use tanning beds, which up the risk for skin cancer. The majority is spray tan. Uh... Now that I'm getting older, I care a lot more about skin cancer and wrinkles and that kind of thing. Um, but I do a little bit of tanning, nothing too crazy. Despite the health risks and the stigma, this sport is growing. In 1982, there were no women in New Brunswick bodybuilding shows. Last year, of the 86 competitors competing at the championships, more than half were women. People like Jacqueline Wilson have contributed to the spike. Though she says she can't compete forever, she does have some clear goals in mind for her fitness career. I look at fitness magazines and fitness women and think that's inspiring and that's what I want to try to achieve. <laughs> 
Wilson also makes competition suits for other women, blending her love for fashion and fitness into a profitable business. She's training for an upcoming promotional gig in Toronto and for future competitions. Jacqueline's career and her sport are picking up speed and neither are showing any signs of slowing down. For Stu Journalism, I'm Bridget Yard. That's all from today's edition. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.